Thank you very much. Uh, what an incredible location and what a wonderful backdrop. I almost feel like we should be shooting a music, music video here <laughs> rather than talking about evidence. Uh, but hopefully in the next 15 minutes, I can get you at least a little bit more excited about evidence. Uh, so as Susan said, I work at the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, or JPAL for short. It's a center at MIT's economics department, which brings together about 120 professors from universities around the world who do randomized evaluations in about 60 countries to try and uh, improve the use of evidence to inform policy. So in the last few weeks, all of us have been really shocked by the images of death and destruction that is coming out of Nepal. Uh, international relief organizations have mobilized, governments have sent people, many of us in this room have opened up our wallets to help the people in Nepal. But unfortunately for all of us, this is not the only tragedy happening. There are many such tragedies happening all over the world. For instance, six million children die every single year under the age of five. Think about that. That's like the entire population of Massachusetts or the entire country of Libya being wiped out every single year. And yet, how come we don't hear so much about these particular tragedies, despite the fact that so many of these deaths are from completely preventable causes like measles or diarrhea or malaria? That's 17,000 children a day. A Nepal happens in this world every day, twice a day. So what is the reason that uh, there's so little attention and so little focus paid to these problems? Uh, I'm very excited to hear Dan Ariely talk about some of the behavioral economic insights later, but I think one of the reasons might be that it's actually very, very hard for us to understand the impact of the work that is happening, of the aid that is flowing uh, to try and help these problems, unlike these earthquakes. So for instance, on this graph, what you can see in the blue bars is that the amount of aid flowing into Africa, for instance, in the last 40, 50 years, has increased dramatically. But if you look at the red line, which is the per capita income of the people in Africa, almost nothing happens. It goes up, it comes down, goes up again, but there's nothing much happening. So, so rightfully so, people start asking the question, what is really the impact of the work that we are doing? What is the impact of these billions of dollars in aid that is going into Africa and other parts of the world? Now, the aid optimists will tell you that, look, you know, if this aid hadn't flown into Africa, the actual income of the people there would have, in fact, been much lower. But there are also aid pessimists out there who will tell you that, no, look, Aid really crowds out very productive private investments. It makes people dependent on aid. And therefore, if you actually hadn't put this money into aid, the income in Africa might actually have been much higher than what it is today. So which story do you believe? And what, on what basis do you believe one story or the other? Do we believe the aid optimists and keep sending money into, uh, in, into Africa in the hope that things will change over time? Or do we believe the aid pessimists and stop doing what we are doing and let this Nepal happen every day, twice a day? So in that way, if we don't really know what the impact of our work is, what the impact of our organizations is, then in that sense, are we any better than these medieval doctors? So 200 years ago, if you fell sick, you would go to these doctors and they would put these leeches on you. Some of, who, some of you would get better, some of you would unfortunately just die. Uh, sometimes the leeches worked, sometimes the leeches didn't work. We didn't really know what was going on. Well, fortunately for us and for Walter White here, <laughs> things have gotten a little bit better. Uh, now when any of us go and get uh, uh, you know, medicines or we get chemotherapy, we can be assured that there is a randomized impact evaluation or, a, or rigorous evidence which has backed uh, this particular medicine and we know that this thing works. So if medicine has been able to transform itself in the last 200 years, then why not us? Why not us in the development community and all of us as organizations and as social entrepreneurs? How about using evidence to inform our decisions? Well, that's because it sounds easier than it is, as all of you know. It is really, really hard to measure the impact of our work. And the reason why it is hard is because if you truly want to know what the impact of your work is, you've got to compare the outcomes of your work to the outcomes that would have happened 
if your organization did not exist or the program did not exist. It is ha like asking, what is the counterfactual if there was no aid that went to Africa? Or I can look around this room and say, what would the counterfactual have been if Omidya Network had not invested in your organizations? So as you can imagine, it's really, really hard to create this parallel universe. Uh, since Susan started on move, her favorite movies, here's my favorite movie. Uh, so if we were all lucky, you know, we would have Michael Caine here, and Michael Caine would say, well, you know, this is how your life would have turned around if you hadn't missed that baseball shot. And all of a sudden, you would be able to build this parallel universe. So what do we do? What do we do as organizations to try and build this parallel universe of, of what impact would have been? Well, one of the things that organizations do is to rely on anecdotes. Uh, you know, anecdotes are very nice stories. Uh, so, you know, I don't have to tell you one, Susan showed you one, uh, uh, of, 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 of how things have transformed people's lives. And this, you know, a, a lot of the microfinance industry 15, 20 years ago was based on anecdotes, and, and, and clearly they have moved forward now, as Susan was describing, towards also collecting data. Uh, this, these are words from the website of uh, one of the organizations that is a big supporter of uh, microfinance, and all of this is based on anecdotes, but you can see uh, microfinance was presented almost as the silver bullet, which would not only lead to increased incomes, but lead to improvements in health, improvements in education, it would lead to women's empowerment, and by the way, also ensure environmental stability. Now, here is the problem with anecdotes. For every anecdote that I can give about your work or my work, which is a positive anecdote, somebody else will come up with a negative anecdote. And this is exactly what happened to microfinance five years ago. And all of a sudden, this industry, which had been doing so much great work and helping so many people uh, in, around the world, was suffering and was in so much trouble, and now being seen as the killer and being seen as the poison pill rather than being seen as the savior. Another, pro another very popular way that organizations try to measure the impact of their work is they say, well, let me look at the outcomes before the program started or before my organization came, and let me compare it to the dollar bar, which is you know, the outcome after my program happened. So for instance, sticking to the example of microfinance, they can say, look, you know, before this microfinance program came, only 40% of the children were going to school, and now 60% of the children go to school, so microfinance has helped get 20% more children, 20 percentage point children more to school. Now, the problem with that story is, is that the world doesn't stand still. Just the way all of you, if you had not gotten help from the Omidya network, would not have gone home and gone to bed. Instead, you would have picked up the phone and dialed somebody else. Similarly, these people, uh, would, uh, who knows what else would have, was happening at that time? It might be that while the same time that you had this microfinance program being rolled out, there was a nonprofit or the government which was trying to really get children into school through a new program that was just introduced. So you are not able to disentangle the impact of your program for the others. So how did medicine get to from where they are, uh, where they were from leeches to, uh, as I say, chemotherapy? So what modern medicine did was randomized impact evaluations. So they looked at the, so here you see there's the outcome, let's say attendance or health outcomes or, or number of people affected over time. And then you bring in your intervention or your introduce your program. But along with your program, you weave in what we call a concurrent impact evaluation. You follow the impact, uh, the outcomes on your treatment group as before. These are the people who receive the program. But because now you have what we call a control group, something similar to what Susan described before, you are actually able to magically create this counterfactual, and you don't really need a Michael Caine anymore. And once you know what the world would have looked like absent your program, you are able to measure the impact of your work much, much more easily. So at this point, many of you are thinking, how does this apply to my organization? What is the relevance of this to me? So I took an example, I think, which is particularly salient to many people in this room, uh, which is how do you convince people to adopt technology? As many of us know, there are lots of technologies. For instance, in this picture, you can see the bed nets, you can see water chlorination, you can see fertilizers, uh, and you can see clean cook stoves. Now, these are all technologies that are extremely inexpensive, very easy to use, 
with a proven impact, and they have massive externalities. They not, not, not only benefit you, but many of them also benefit the people around you. And yet, in study after study, in country after country, we find that the adoption rate of these technologies is far less than what you would hope it would be. So how can you improve the adoption rate of these technologies and, uh, and, 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 and make sure that its true potential is realized? Now, let me take one example, since I'm already on the child mortality case, of malaria. 600,000 people die every year because of malaria. Think about that number. Most of these are children. That is five Nepalese earthquakes happening every single month. And yet, the insecticide-treated bed net is a technology which has existed forever, proven to be extremely uh, effective. You go to sub-Saharan Africa, you go to the targeted population, which is the one which should be using insecticide-treated bed nets, and the adoption rate is just about 36%. Very, very low. And here's the really incredible part. People don't spend 50 cents that it costs to buy these bed nets and then end up spending about $12 in treatment for after they get malaria. So that raises the question, if you are a social entrepreneur or you are a nonprofit or a foundation or an impact investor, that is it that the price is a barrier despite the fact that it's a highly subsidized price? Can giving this product for free really lead to an increased adoption and increased usage? Well, some of us would say yes, but a lot of the people would say no. And they would say no for mostly the following reason. They would say if you give something for free to people, they will never value it. And if they don't value what they get, they will never use it. This is a, this is a picture of people using the bed nets as fishing nets. And, 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 and so people will show this picture and say, look, this is why you should never give something for free. So the question for us here is, if you are in this position, how do you decide? There are half your staff telling you, let's give it for free, and half your staff telling you, no, let's not give it for free. And both sides have very, very good, valid reasons. Do you use your instincts? Do you use your ideology? Do you keep doing what you have been doing and just uh, go with inertia? Or can you use evidence? So it so happens that uh, two of our affiliated professors, Pascaline Dupas from Stanford University and uh, uh, Jessica Cohen from Harvard decided to test exactly that. They went to Kenya, they went to a room like this, which had a lot of pregnant women, uh, so a little different from you, um, and, they, and what they did is they would call people into the room and they would offer them this bed net, but at randomly chosen prices. So the first person who walked into the room was said, hey, you can get a bed net for $2. Person number two, you get it today for zero. Person number three, you get it for 65 cents. So, so they randomly varied the price which was offered to these people. And then, and, then, and then started following these people over time. The first thing that they observe is that there is a huge decline in take up when you move from zero price to any positive price. So even moving, for, you know, this, these bed nets cost between six to seven dollars in the market outside. Even if you moved from zero price to 65 cents, there was a 40 percentage point decline in the number of people who were willing to take these bed nets. So that makes you first of all start thinking, is, it, is there something about charging a positive price versus giving free which is causing the problem? Now here is something even more interesting. What they find is they went and tracked the people's usage, and what they find is there is no difference in the usage of these bed nets in the ground, in the houses, whether you paid for these bed nets or you got them for free. So this whole notion that if people don't pay for something, they're not going to use it, was not found to be true in the aggregate over the entire group of people. Now, that still leaves one third question in the mind of a lot of, these people, a lot of you here. What about financial, stability, uh, you know, financial sustainability? If I give it for free, that's all fine and good, uh, but ultimately my organization will go out of business because I cannot recoup the prices. So here's what Pascaline did. She went back after one year, tracked down all the people who had received the bed net, and now she offered them a second bed net, but everybody was this time given only one choice. You can buy it for $2. No discounts, no, no subsidy, no zero prices. And look what happened. The people who had gotten the bed net for free were as likely, if not more, to 
buy this bed net for $2 compared to those who had actually paid a price for it. So, you know, in a sense, people did not get used to free, they got used to the bed net. They, got, they used the bed net, they understood what the benefits were, and they were now willing to pay for it. So you can see, all of a sudden, now evidence has, you know, ha has reduced this trade-off which you had in your mind. Your heart was telling you that, you know, I'm in this business, I'm in international development, and I'm, in this, I'm a social entrepreneur because I want most maximum number of people to have this benefit. But your head was saying, no, that I should not do it because people will not use it, and what will happen to my financial stability? And all of a sudden, you have these answers here, and uh, this is one of the answers that PSI used uh, to massively scale up the distribution of free bed nets after they saw this evidence. Other organizations have used the results from impact evaluation uh, to, to gain credibility for the work they are doing. So, For instance, a few years ago, a number of our affiliates uh, evaluated the work done by Pratham, which was at that time a very small NGO in India working in education and found that teaching to the ability of the children, what is known as, you know, almost a four-letter word in the United States called tracking, really, really helps. And it is, has more impact than providing school inputs like textbooks or more teachers. And Pratham used these numbers to go back to a lot of foundations, leveraged uh, more resources from the foundations, has scaled up and now reaches tens of millions of children in India. It's one of the biggest NGOs in the world. Uh, and its work is being scaled up uh, in other countries as well. So to conclude, uh, thanks to some generous funding from the Omidya Network, for which we are really grateful, both JPAL and our partner organizations, Innovation for Poverty Action, which is represented here today by my colleague Annie Duflo, uh, are, are really able to work with many, many more organizations like you to think about how you can use existing evidence to try and inform your initial decisions and your strategy. Wherever necessary, work with you to try and design new innovative programs, test these out, and then try and take it to scale and institutionalize this change. Uh, I, I work on the MIT campus, and very, very close to my office uh, is this signpost, <laughs> which, you know, which is very much like people will come and take a picture next to this, uh, this sign. Uh, but, it, but, but what I find is that this neatly summarizes the problem that or the challenge that we have in communicating to a lot of organizations about the importance of using evidence to inform policy. But I do hope that the last 15 minutes have told you that your head and your heart can actually point in the same direction many times. Thank you very much.